Greetings and welcome to OP Tuesdays. If you love our programs, then you want to listen to this short announcement before the lecture. As you know, I organize and host the live streams personally. Since I need to take two months of medical leave, don't worry, it's fine. We have put the live streams on a temporary break. But don't worry, we have you covered with fantastic pre-recorded lectures that we are excited to share with you. These videos will be premiered at our usual time and you can watch them together so that you can discuss them in the chat or you can watch them anytime later. We have also stopped the weekly newsletter and the weekly word puzzles, both of which will start again in June. Here's the overview of our calendar for the next two months. OP Tuesdays will continue with pre-recorded lectures till the second half of May when we have our summer vacations. And information regarding the upcoming lectures will be shared midweek and on Mondays. To get all the details, stay connected and updated by following our social media pages using our handle at Oral Pathology 360 or visit our website at oralpathology360.com and follow the events calendar. Or then, if you haven't already done so, hit the subscribe and the bell buttons right here to receive all the notifications. And it is sad not to meet every week, but we shall return soon. Meanwhile, the scheduled lectures are great, and I'm sure you will find them valuable. If you want to help at this time, we would appreciate it very much if you interacted with the content, commented, and shared the videos while our own sharing activities are mostly paused. And we thank you for your understanding and support always. Enjoy your lecture, and I'll see you in some time. All right, you're thinking, oh, wh where are you going with this one? Why are you showing me a retroperitoneal mass? There's method here. So I'm gonna show you some soft tissue tumors and I'm gonna explain why they're important for us as oral pathologists. Because I'm, I was in residence, I'm like, why am I looking at kidneys? And why am I looking at colons? And why am I looking at, um, at gallbladders? It's because when they show up in the oral cavity, I have an idea what I'm looking at. So I'm gonna start with this bloody kind of mess. And whenever I'm outside the oral cavity, I'm gonna go look for something normal. I don't see anything normal here yet. All I see is a very hemorrhagic tumor. Well, I can think, okay, what are the organs behind the retroperitoneum that are hemorrhagic? The only really retroperitoneal organs you have are the kidneys and the adrenal glands. So guess what? I'm gonna show you a kidney or an adrenal gland tumor probably, right? So first I'm seeing that this is all tumor. There's nothing organized. I don't see any organized kidney structure here. I don't see any organized adrenal cortex and medulla. Until I get here, there's a difference here versus here. So the first thing I'm going to try to do is figure out what organ I'm in. And if you're a student of a little bit of normal anatomy, and I teach normal histology. I teach up at UT Dallas with a colleague of mine. Those are glomeruli. And if you don't believe me, there they are. So at least now I know I'm in the kidney. Okay, so why, as an oral pathologist, am I, am I showing you a kidney? Well, if you heard me say this morning, one of the most common metastases that I've seen, at least in residency, are kidney cancers. They like to go to the gingiva and the jaws. So I have some beautiful, normal kidney anatomy here. This is the reason for us to learn the normal histology. So I have proximal and distal convoluted tubules. I have a glomerulus. It's beautiful. It's lovely. But now I'm going to look at the tumor. The first thing I can see is I can see nests of cells and they're optically clear. Okay. I'm already at this power. I'm comfortable enough saying this is kidney cancer. I've seen enough of these to know that this is kidney cancer and it's clear cell. It's a clear cell tumor. It has a little bit of pigment and that's doesn't necessarily make it a melanoma. This is just kidney cancer. This is what clear cell renal cell carcinoma looks like. So what I did here is I turned off my condenser to kind of show you what do I see. That's, I don't know what's going on here, but they're very granular, right? So that's the first thing. What I'm actually doing here, if you look at this very carefully, this is my measuring device on my oculum. And you're thinking, why did I do that? What I was doing here was trying to get a sense of how big the nuclei are. Because I'm gonna talk about the Furman grading system in a minute. This is, this is outside my scope, but I'm comfortable enough with this having seen a couple of cases. So 
I have, I have, I did some fancy photography with my oculum. In other areas, it looks a little bit more solid, but the nuclear features are still the same. So the nuclei are kind of large. They're a little bit larger than the normal nuclei. That's what I was drawing. So the normal nucleus would have been probably one or two marks on, on this. These nuclei are three or four marks. And I'm going to explain what that means in terms of the Fermin grading system. So I know I've got a kidney cancer. And again, if I look at this, I can see, let's blow this up again. Let's count the marks. I don't remember what the microns were, but again, if you can see that nucleus, that's probably like three marks big. Normal should be one or two, as I recall. And again, they have this sort of, you know, eosinophilic cytoplasm, some are optically clear. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Let me escape out of that, sorry. Okay, other areas, same thing, very prominent nucleoli, and you can kind of see some background cells, right? If that's, we'll, we'll just presume maybe that's a lymphoid cell. So the nuclei are just large, right? We use a background, you know, there's small and large nuclei. There's blood vessels because the kidney is vascular. And again, I've just, I've, I've, I've added in the, the, the measuring device here. And then other areas, you see they're very, very nested. And now they're getting even more hyperchromatic. And then there's some optical curious cells. So this is very typical of kidney cancers. And again, I just put my measuring device to this again. So you can kind of see some backgrounds, some are smaller. Those are probably lymphocytes. So you see how much, if that's a lymphocyte, look at how much larger those nuclei are. They're twice the size, All right? So it shouldn't surprise you, this is a clear cell variant of renal cell carcinoma. So why is it Furman grade four? We're gonna talk about that. Um, and, and I'm not necessarily making the Furman grade diagnosis in a metastatic um, lesion. It's almost by definition grade four if it's metastatic. But what I wanted to show you is I just pulled these out of um, the urologic journals. And I, I keep these in the background because they've changed the grading and staging a little bit. But it has to do with the nuclei size um, in terms of microns. So I think in, in this particular case, I think that the tumor cells, I think I was looking at those at 400x. So I think they were like something like 30 or 35 microns in size. Each one of those mark, or marks was 10 microns. So they're very large. And then if they have very prominent nucleoli or, and or a lot of polymorphism, and then they get graded up. So this one had large nuclei and it actually, I think it had tumor nucleoli. So we're at least grade three in this case. And that's important. The other thing that's important is, is kidney cancer is one of those things is that's the one cancer they won't needle. Because once you needle, you automatically stage them at four because there's a thought you'll seed the tumor cells elsewhere. Okay, so... Um, I'll show you one more abdominal mass. And this was an interesting case. The reason I'm going to show you this case is an oral pathologist, oh, 15, 20 years ago, and I saw the original slide. He was my instructor. He made a diagnosis of multiple oral mucosal neurofibromas. The patient got a neurofibromatosis case. So I want to show you why it's important as oral pathologists, if we make a, a if we lead to a neurofibromas case, I'm going to show you. Now I, I start with let's figure out where we're at. So I'm going to show you this organ at some point, and I'm going to let you determine what organ we're in. So this is smooth, this is smooth muscle, right? Where it's in the abdomen. That should lead you to believe that we're in the GI tract somewhere. So this is somewhere in the GI tract. This is all GI tract, right? We're gonna talk about where in the GI tract are we in the colon, are we in the stomach? We're gonna find that out. All I know is I have complex crypts and I have lots of sort of almost villi here. So I'm somewhere probably in, 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 the, in the small or large intestine. That's the tumor we're gonna look at. One of the tumors we're gonna look at. So we're gonna start with this tumor. It's a nested tumor. It has a salt and pepper chromatin appearance. Okay, so where are we? Where are we? We're kind of in this neuroendocrine. Am I looking at a paraganglioma? Am I looking at what kind of neuroendocrine tumor am I looking at? This is all part of the same tumor. And you can see there's some larger cells, some smaller cells, but if I blow this up, right, they're kind of salt and peppery. 
different nuclear features. So that we know we have a neuroendocrine tumor. This is all the same tumor, some very large cells. So these neuroendocrine tumors, right, can have neuroendocrine atypia. All right, so the question is what, or, so, so, I, so I'm gonna tell you that we were in the colon, right? I'm gonna tell you this is actually, go back here, that's colon. If you don't blame me, we'll blow it up, right? It's kind of blurry, but these are all big, tall sort of goblet type cells. So we were, in the, we were actually in the colon here. Now, the question is, what part of the colon am? I'm going to tell you, based on the histology, I can tell you what part of the colon we were in. So we're going to go back to the slideshow. So we were in the part of the colon adjacent to this organ. So I'm going to ask you, based on this and based on that, does anybody know what organ we're in? I'm going to let you all decide that one. Anybody want to shout out, do we know what organ is? What is this? And what does it produce? Anyone want to chime in? I'll give you about five or 10 seconds to think, but then I'll tell you what it is. Okay, so hearing nothing, that's the eyelets of Langerhans right there. That makes insulin. Therefore, that's pancreas, right? So which side's the body is your pancreas on? It's on the left side, right? So think about where am I at? I'm actually probably at the junction of the transverse and the descending colon. So, so this neuroendocrine tumor is in that part of the colon. I'm on the left side. And I was able to, I was able to figure that. Now, of course, I actually saw the imaging, but you're kind of on the left side on this patient. That's important, right? Because the surgeon needs to know where he's going to remove the tumor from. So, so I asked my learners this question. And the general pathologist struggled for a minute. And then I said, oh, it's that, you know, it's nice, it's nice to be able to figure out where you're at. Okay. So to prove that I'm in the colon, right, that's what colon looks like, right? Tall columnar cells with lots of sort of goblet cells, right? What's the colon's job with this inflammatory background? It's to reabsorb water and make fecal matter, right? That's what it is. It's, its job is to produce poo. So that's the first tumor, okay? Now, this is a patient who has neurofibromatosis. So we're going to see they get neuroendocrine tumors, as it turns out. There's some surprises here. Second thing is to realize, what is this? This is lymphoid tissue, right? So guess what? You have pyres, patches, and lymphoid tissue. So I'm just showing you normal anatomic features of the GI. And I actually teach. So to me, the GI is just an extension of the oral cavity. It starts here and it goes to the other end. So you have sort of, you know, mucus glands in the areas. There are some eosinophils here because there's always some inflammatory component to this. You do have these long crypts. Their job is to absorb. When you look at the gland sideways, so this is what the GI pathologist is looking for. When it looks a little blue like this, they have to ask, oh, am I looking at atypia? Am I looking at a colon cancer? In this case, it wasn't. But I'm going to show you in between the layers of smooth muscles, you actually have this ganglion or plexus, right? This hour box plexus, right? So this is smooth muscle. It's what allows for peristalsis. And then you have these, these are large sort of nerve type ganglion cells. This is what controls the motility of your GI tract. And then you have the serosa on the outside surface. So as again, I'm showing you some anatomy just to get you in tune with, okay, what if I have a metastatic tumor that's coming from the colon? Where's it going? So this is just fat. This is the serosa. And so what's this tumor? It's a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. And the reason I'm going to talk about carcinoids is you can see them in the head and neck, right? Sometimes they come up with different names. Even essentially paragangliomas are kind of neuroendocrine tumors. Really, they are. So you'll see them in the head and neck, right? Glomus, glomus jugulari, glomus tympanicum, carotid body tumors, things like that. They're all kind of in the same family. But the reason I'm going to tell you about this is because there has been some changes. And if anybody has gone to USCAP or the, 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 um, the pathology meetings, this is one of them, the topics they've been talking about, even in the head and neck. So neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine carcinomas are based on differentiated. So if they're very well differentiated, they'll call them typical carcinoids or well differentiated or G1, G2 neuroendocrine tumors. If they become poorly differentiated, then they become either small or large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas. And then there are some 
some sort of mixed neuro, mixed neuroendocrine, non-neuroendocrine neoplasms. G, GI and neuroendocrine tumors, all right? So you have to be aware of this because they're all considered essentially, you have to treat them like malignancy. But when they're well differentiated like this, a lot of times they can be removed. So it's, it turns out neuroendocrine tumors are one of the tumors that does show up in neurofibromatosis. We're used to thinking about neurofibromas, but there are, you know, there are, um, peripheral, uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors that can pop up neuroendocrine tumors. So this is an opportunity to talk about the changes to the staging and grading and nomenclature in case you see one of these in the head and neck. And of course, now what's going to happen here is my system is going to, is going to misbehave for a moment. Okay, there we go. So now I want to put it into the context of the tumors that we're more familiar with because we're in the same sort of family. So there's GI neuroendocrine tumors, and then there's the sort of the paraganglia type tumors, and they're all kind of in the same family. So these neuroendocrine neoplasms, and these are generally well differentiated ones. There are a couple of enemy histochemical chemical markers. So the question was asked earlier, like what markers do you do? I will almost invariably for these blue cell tumors include a chroma, chromogrammin and a synaptophysin. And there's something called INSM1. I've never used it. What we're also finding now is a lot of these, these paragangliomas and pheos, these neuroendocrine tumors, right? So pheos are adrenal neuroendocrine tumors. Paragangliomas are extra adrenal neuroendocrine tumors. And a lot of them will harbor SDH mutations. And guess what? Now there are SDH immunohistochemical um, markers. And I think what you when you look at um, individuals like Jason Hornick and some of the other head and neck people, what they're doing now is investigating, um, do the SDH mutations have a potential therapeutic um, option for them? Last group, even though I said I'm not a lymphoma guy, I think it's worth it to show you some lymphomas because there are a few that pop up. So my first question I'm always going to ask everybody, if this is a supracovicular mass, what kind of organ is it? So it's, it's a very large organ. It does have some blue cells that form sort of nodules. It's surrounded by fat, and it's right above the clavicle. So it's a lymph node. It's a very scarred down lymph node. Now, you may already know where I'm going with this. I'm going to show you a lymphoid lesion that has a lot of scar-like collagenous septations. I'm going to use the term nodular, and I'm going to use the term sclerosis. So what I'm going to be looking for is a variation of lymphoma. And what's one of the most common lymphomas? Nodular sclerosing Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I've looked at this lymph node. It's occupied by something that's destroying the follicles. But these are still trying to be follicles. So the first thing I need is I need to go into the follicles. And what am I going to be looking for? I'm looking for Reed Sternberg cells. That's all I'm looking for at this point, because I want to determine if this is going to be a Hodgkin's or a non-Hodgkin's. So I'm going to show you some areas. That's probably a Reed Sternberg, right? So let's, I'm going to sort of, I'm going to stay out of my presentation for a second. I'm going to blow these up, right? This weird kind of multinucleated cell. There's another weird one. Let's keep tracking down through this. Intermediate view. We're going to go, I'll come down like this, then we're going to come back up. All right, that's kind of a bizarre cell right there. Very prominent nuclei. They don't have to be double eyes, sometimes they can be single eyes. We talk about owl eye cells. Go back into this, right? I've got these nodular areas of this, what, what was a follicle with this sclerosing area in the background. And then I go back up. I thought that was one of the better examples of a popcorn cell. These are, I have a hard time finding these. I, I admit it. I go back and I look at these a couple of times. And then, of course, I send this to the hematopathologist and they go, oh, it's nodular sclerosing Hodgkin's lymphoma. You will find eosinophils in these. So that helps me with the diagnosis. Just like mast cells. Great question, by the way. Mast cells can help you get to a nerve diagnosis. I think eosinophils can help you get to a Hodgkin's diagnosis. So I've sort of given away the answer already. I'm going to come here. Now, other areas, and I'm sorry this got kind of very bled out, but I was, I was it, very bright, it was very light. But again, I want to show you how many eosinophils there are here. So there's lots of them. 
And then I'm going to show you, right, it kind of wants to make a follicle. It looks like there's some tingible body macrophages in here. But when I blow it up again, right, that's bizarre, right? That's one cell. At least that's how I interpret it. That's probably one cell. That's how I interpreted it. We'll go around the edge. That's kind of almost owl eye cell here. And the, usually the cells are kind of surrounded by a couple sort of lymphoid cells. So if you look at them in these areas, right, they'll have this kind of little surrounding halo of cells around them. And then sometimes the individual cells will have um, halos around them as well. And then if I go into another view, the reason I'm not showing this as a presentation is I want to be able to do this very quickly. Lots of eosinophils. There's a big one. 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 And then you even have these single nucleoli with a very prominent nucleoli. Your, your histiocytes, because the histiocytes can look like this, but the histiocytes don't have this prominent nucleolus, at least not as I learned. You also start to see maybe some of this beginning cell death, carrier hexis kind of stuff going on. So we'll go one more. I took a lot of pictures of this one because I want to get as much evidence for you as possible. Right. There's a kind of a bizarre one right there. As opposed to, you know, maybe that's just a histiocyte. I don't know. Of course, I can figure that out by doing, you know, a CD20, a CD30, a CD15. These should pick up. And if these, CD, these cells are CD68, they'll be histiocytes. So it shouldn't surprise you that we're going to get to a diagnosis of nodular sclerosing hot classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I didn't sign this case out. These were the, these were the only four stains that the, that the hematopathologist did. A 15, a 30 positive together. Um, fashion is known to be positive. Um, I asked him, did you do Eber? He goes, I didn't feel the need to do it in this case. I already knew what it was. But if you do an Eber on these cases, right, these are very commonly these Hodgkin's cases have an EBV association. So why am I showing you a Hodgkin's lymphoma? Because that is one of the lymphomas that shows up somewhat commonly in the head and neck. So that's a lymphoma case. So this is really, really busy. I understand this. This was my attempt to make sense of lymphomas. So what I actually found is almost every lymphoma has a heavy chain translocation. Almost every single one of them does. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come out of here and I'm going to blow this up for a second. So I'm gonna start around the wheel here. So I actually have a whiteboard in my house. So what I've noticed is that if they have an IGH mutation with a MYC, that's automatically the Burkitt high-grade lymphoma stuff. If they have a, a BCL6, they're probably in the high-grade lymphoma diagnosis. So diffuse large B cells. If they have a BCL2, we're usually in more the, the, the chronic lymphocytic leukemia, small lymphocytic leukemia. So they're a little bit lower grade. So BCL6 is worse than BCL2, kind of, right? They're all non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Then they will also, but they will also include the follicular lymphomas. And the way you can figure those out is the follicular or especially the germinal cell type will have uh, also CD10 and BCL6, right? So if I start with the tumor, and I know that I've got likely an IGH <laughs> um, translocation. If it's, if it's positive for a lot of B cell markers, but it doesn't have cyclin D1 and it doesn't have BCL2, it's probably one of these high grade diffuse large. If it has B cell markers plus sort of the germinal center or follicular markers with BCL2, but it doesn't have the cyclin D1, it's probably CLL, SLL. If it picks up CD10, it's now germinal center type. If it picks up all the CD30, CD15, Eber stuff, now we're going to be into the Hodgkin's um, areas, right? And then and their, their four, 14s is usually with a chromosome 9 or something else. And then you can do all these other stains. Um, if they pick up ALK mutations and have a lot of large cells, CD30, TIA, perforin, now you're in the anaplastic large cells. If they pick up 
cyclin D1, you're almost automatically in mantle cell, and these are worse. And then if you actually pick up um, a number of um, light chains, 4, 4, 4, 16, and 20, and then you start getting the CD31 theates, now you're in the myeloma cases, or the plasma blastics. And then you go back to the highest um, grade lymphoma. So what I tried to do here, this is my own edification. I refer back to this table all the time table, chart, whatever you like to do. One of these is I'm going to try to create a graphic for this. Dr. Mandana, if you have a graphic team and you want to have fun at this, I'll send you this picture. All right. So I showed you that to show you get a hematopathologist to look at these cases. Right. But if it's, you know, it's, oops, I didn't want to do that. So it's, if it's, um, you can sort of tease out according to whether it's MIC or, cyclin D1 or BCL6 or BCL2, it'll help you determine kind of which way you're going to go down towards. And the other thing is you look at morphologically. I mean, CLL, SLL, they're almost uniformly small cells. Mantle cells are probably going to be fairly small cells. Whereas anaplastic large cells, um, Hodgkin's, diffuse large B cell, they will have some larger nuclei. And then if they're in the plasma blastic or plasma cytoma like, then you're either in high grade plasma blastic lymphomas, so HIV, immunosuppressed, Epstein Barr related, myeloma type stuff like that. So um, if anybody's ever heard Dr. Lewis, uh, not Dr. Lewis, um oh, just blanked. Um oh I just blanked. Um you'll see the term Mr. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Thompson, Lester Thompson. So Lester Thompson, he's, he, if anybody's ever heard him, he's, he's from South Africa originally, I think, too. So he's, he's got the sort of accent. But he came up with the Mr. Sleep mnemonic. So this is how I will start. I love this mnemonic. For adult, for adult small round cell tumors, these are the tumors. So guess what? This goes back to the question this morning. Order a melanoma marker. Order maybe a skeletal muscle marker, MyoD1, for instance. Um, you know, you can consider ordering genetic tests, order some lymphoid markers, order some neuroendocrine markers, go ahead, order a CD99, or consider a Ewing sarcoma translocation, then maybe order, you know, a CD138. And then of course, you know, there can be some high grade pituitary adenomas. So you can order some neuroendocrine markers for those. Uh, I don't know who came up with Mr. Downer, but for pediatric tumors, right? So Kids can get metastases to the head, but the met metastatic tumors, it's a whole different group. They're not carcinomas. They tend to be all these um, blastemal tumors. So medulloblastoma, right? Brain. So small round blue cell tumor, they probably get it in the brain. So you, see, you look at an image, you'll see it in the cerebellum. Rhabdomyosarcoma, that's usually listed as the most common sarcoma in kids. That's easy, right? Skeletal muscle markers, myoD1, things like that. Desmoplastic small round cell tumors, those are the ones that sort of pick up epithelial and muscle markers, right? They're kind of weird. Osteosarcomas, hopefully you can find, even in the blue, the undifferentiated kind, hopefully you can find some bone in those. Um, there are some, there are some potential use for CD99 and a few other markers. Now, Wilms tumor, again, those are going to be more kidneys. Neuroblastomas, so again, you have anesthesia neuroblastoma in adults, you have neuroblastomas in kids. Very easy. Go look at it. Go look at an MRI of the kid's abdomen if you have it, and there's probably going to be a tumor behind the kidney in the adrenal gland. Ewing sarcoma that's becoming fairly ubiquitous. Seems like we see a lot of those cases. Easy, you can do CD99 and then do a Ewing sarcoma translocation, and then retinoblastomas. You know, obviously the patient's probably going to be missing an eye, and they're going to be very young. So um, I'll leave you with this thought. My son, when he was eight, said, "I'm going to make a Lego oral pathologist." And I said, well, you got the hair right, because I'm bald. So um, that was pretty much all I had. I want, But I wanted to give you a taste of all the challenging cases. I didn't talk about adonogenic and most salivary tumors, because so I think we get, and even the carcinomas, that's stuff that's like, you know, that's in our wheelhouse. You are probably more expert at carcinomas than I am, because we know the rate of squamous cell carcinoma is probably higher in India, unless the date has changed than anywhere else. So I will stop sharing my screen and we can open it up to some questions. Let's 
see if there are any questions. I saw a few people Start. recognize pancreas. Thank you. Yes, they did. By the time I sort of uh, could get myself to read it, uh, we had moved on, so I left it. I had any articles that suggest that any of my material is out of date, please let Dr. Mandana know so I can correct my presentations. Uh, I saw I saw uh, Sruti said, uh, sir, has a hem hematological examination result surprised you, confused you whenever you were almost convinced histological with the clinical diagnosis? Just a curious question. Um, I can honestly say no, because every time that I've had any question, I've had a hematopathologist look at it. And so, so far, knock on wood, I think we're doing very fine. I think, I think the, I will say only once. So it was a young gentleman. He was about 28 years old and he came in for a dental exam. And I found a, a, a mass over his sternocleidomastoid. It was large enough. Now it was, fortunately it was free and it was tender it was not fixed and, and non tender, but I'm like, I don't know if that's a lymphoma or if that's going to be a soft tissue tumor. So I looked at his tonsils clinically and they were red, but not asymmetric. So I was worried enough. I sent him to oral surgery the next day, the day after he actually had a CT. They thought they saw an enlargement of his tonsil. And the ENT surgeons took him up to the operating room and put a did a core biopsy, and it was a schwannoma. So that was probably my own surprise. I was worried about a lymphoma, and I and everybody's like, you know what, you did the right thing. You talked about the most problematic thing this could be, and uh, and then he got a benign diagnosis. So he was, and this unfortunately was over Christmas, like two two or three years ago. So you know the patient was stressed over Christmas a little bit, but then you know like. Two days before New Year's, he got a benign diagnosis and he was much happier. And then they were just going to arrange a time for him to have that just removed. It was about a two centimeter mass. That's probably the only ever surprise that I got expecting a potential for a lymphoma and got a benign diagnosis. So the advantages of if we're all doing, you know, pathologists have a tendency, a lot of them just look at the microscope. But when you go see patients, and Nasser can attest to this, when we were at Long Island, we saw patients on Whatever. For me, it was Thursday mornings. Laying your hands on patients is important to the to the thing. So I think this unfortunate adversary relationship sometimes we have between oral medicine and oral pathology, I think the two specialties can blend very, very well. And Nasser, I'm going to call you out. I will. He will tell you. I will call him and ask him, hey, do you have some clinical thoughts on this one? I don't know what to do with this case. Or somebody like... Um, okay. You know, somebody like Madhu Shresha or, or one of our new graduates or Sonal Shah, who is at UNLV, she sees a lot of clinical patients. I'm like, can you give me your opinion on this? I need some help with this case. Or I've called up Vicky, I've, I've called up um, Suk Wu, you know, at, 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 at Brigham and Women's. I'm like, I need some oral medicine help with this. So don't lose sight of our clinical, probably where you are in, 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 in India and the Middle East and stuff. I mean, very high rates of, right, good use, pan use, um, probably seeing more of those clinically than we are. And, you know, in South America, I see all the big, crazy pinborg tumors and all the weird infectious diseases. So those are the things that surprise me. Sorry, I went on a digression there. So great questions, though. Anyone else? If you have a question, you know, if you're on LinkedIn, just find me there. You'll you'll know it's me. I think my LinkedIn picture is me staring at a microscope. Yes, so. and uh, you're also there in our on our LinkedIn uh, page of Oral Pathology 360. Also, yes. so yes, message yep. will get to you. Trust me, I'm going to I'm going to tag you in a little bit, Doc, Dr. Mandana. I got to tell everybody about my, about our experience today. So, so. excellent. Cool. I told you, I was like, I'm doing a master class. They're like, what? So, <laughs> well, it's us. Because if a uh, master class. Yep. So, because if there's nothing else, I would simply say what I say to my friends every night when I do yoga. I will say namaste to everybody who is who is practicer yes. of yoga. Your certificate has been shared. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. I can see you, and I can see the cop the picture of the certificate. Yeah, <laughs> I can see everyone. Good job, Dr. Mandana. You can you can close the room anytime you want now. So so I, I, I was very happy to do this. I like teaching and uh, 
when Dr. Mandana actually said, would you like to do this? I'm like, let me go to my institution and get some, get the okie dokies to do this. Yeah, so. done. Yeah. Yes, there's just a lot of thank yous and, uh, you know, excellent presentations and uh, similar statements. And yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. David. And yes, namaste. <laughs> Have a nice uh, day for everyone who is starting and a good night to everyone on this side of the world. Uh, right. Okay. Have a great one, everybody. Lovely having everyone here. Bye.